colours. Though personally, I would have gone with diagonal stripes. Better for your face shape. But anyway, welcome my human friends. I remain your humble host, the multi-sighted mutant Funky M. And I have seen this same story play out in many different ways. For example, somewhere between the time that Charles Xavier and Eric Lenscher first met, and the congressional hearing in the not too distant future, something went down to put Professor X and Magneto on opposite sides of the coin. Let's take a look at that story. Released in 2011, X-Men First Class is a soft reboot of sorts, telling the origin of Professor X and Magneto, and the first incarnation of the X-Men, who have been gathered to stop a nuclear apocalypse. So come with me, my human friends, as we step back in time to the very first founding of the X-Men. It's quite literally, First Class. The tale of the modern mutant age begins in 1944, with a boy named Eric. Separated from his family, he exhibits a strange talent, which is of great interest to Camp Commandant Schmidt. But this gift only presents itself in great emotional stress. Thus, in rage and grief, the Master of Magnetism is born. So there's another life-changing encounter happening around this time in New York, but we'll get back to that. Skip ahead by 18 years, and Eric is now a man. Seeking vengeance he could not exact at the height of the Nazi regime. Whereas CIA agent Moira McTaggart seeks Schmidt, now one Sebastian Shaw, for different reasons. Namely because he's just convinced a general to put US missiles in a Turkish installation. So I'm not really up on my Cold War history, but a quick email exchange with Beast reveals that putting missiles in Turkey would mean that they were too close for the Soviet early warning system to kick in if they were fired. McTaggart needs an expert on mutants, which she finds in one Charles Francis Xavier. And while her bosses are less than impressed, sometimes it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. Eric finds Schmidt slash Shaw and his entourage. Enter Xavier and the US forces, who convince Eric not to die for vengeance. And so, our mutants are given their own facility, where we meet Hank McCoy, and discover Cerebro, which of course leads to a recruitment montage. Don't get your hopes up, Wolfie's only a cameo in this one. With our protagonists gathered, they discuss code names, and showcase abilities. But our heroes have bigger fish to fry, on a mission to Russia. Without sure, the CIA are reluctant to move. But Eric isn't CIA, and he won't be denied. And it's only recently that they've come up with plastic weaponry. These flat scans. They don't catch on too quick. But there's worse to come back in the US, as Shaw destroys the facility, and tries to talk the recruits into joining him. And one of them does! Darwin intervenes, but he won't adapt to this. But the rest of the team won't let Darwin's death be in vain, and at Xavier's mansion, they begin training for battle. Must have been difficult to train without all the mod cons we've got these days. Reminds you how lucky we are to live in this time. But then again, it does mean that they never had to face the horrors of the Danger Room. Scars. But Hank has derived a cure for mutancy from Raven's Mystique's blood. She tries to talk him out of it, but he takes the cure and... isn't cured. 
The next morning, our heroes set off toward the finale. The US and Russia are set to start a war, and only a small band of mutants can stop them, and the mutants only plans of Sebastian Shaw. To get America back for the missiles in Turkey, Russia decides that it wants to put missiles in Cuba, and then it decides that it doesn't. But by then, Shaw's forces have taken over the missile ship. Somewhere between rage and serenity, Eric pulls Shaw's submarine out of the water, and heads inside for a final confrontation. Which leads, inevitably, to the end of Sebastian Shaw. That's no kind of way to die if you ask me. Coin through the brain while psychically paralysed. But humans in 1962 are a nasty bunch, and they fire on our mutant heroes. Which is no problem for a master of magnetism. But it is a problem for Charles, who catches a stray bullet for his troubles. I can't feel my legs. So Professor X is wheelchair bound. Magneto forms a brotherhood of mutants. And Moira McTaggart is removed from the picture. So, another one down. And I think this one deserves its spot on the Mutanthon team. The saga begins again, switched from the not too distant future to the ever more distant past. Though still relatively recent, as the 1960s were. And actually, it works. It works as an origin story for Magneto, which is how it was originally planned, before it became the ensemble it is. And as an introduction to the new cast, who will carry this franchise through at least two more movies. And speaking of these characters, McAvoy's Lausch pre-professor Charles Xavier, Fassbender's vengeance-driven pre-Magneto Eric Lenscher, Jennifer Lawrence's socially awakening mutant and proud mystique, and even Nicholas Holt's awkward nerdy pre-beast Hank McCoy, they shine on screen. Whereas the second string mutants, Shaw's Hellfire Entourage, Banshee and Havoc, are less memorable. Kevin Bacon is every inch the Bond villain in the role of Sebastian Shaw, which is slightly silly, but the menace is subtle. Cold. The basic plot starts out well enough, before splitting in two, and then joining back up again, but never really loses focus, switching between scenes to add tension or cut tension, though it does take a back seat to the characters, which is really how a movie should work, with the characters driving the plot, and not vice versa. And like the first X-Men movie, 11 years before, it's well performed, even as it's so much more action oriented, with 20 something Xavier and Magneto. The flow of this movie, being that it necessarily cuts away from Magneto at times in the first hour, finds time to set up these characters, and the Cold War world of 1962. And while the early scenes of Xavier and Mystique's relationship might get in the way of the Magneto story, they do pay off later when Mystique makes her decision to join the Brotherhood. And again, this is the start of the conversation, the great debate as to whether mutants, or whatever else mutants are analogous to, really do have a right to exist in this world. And we can keep asking this, and we'd never get an answer, but it's enough to keep the conversation in our minds. All in all, director Matthew Vaughan restarts a stalled franchise with a great cast, a high stakes story, and a world which can only grow from here. And it grows alright, but we'll get to that. For now, this is your multi-sighted mutant host Funky M inviting you to join me next week as we take a quantum leap forward for days of future past. Till then, see you around, humans.